Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Buck? Here. Senator Daly? Here. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Lang? Here. Senator Pazina? Here. Senator Scheibel? Here. Senator Stone? Here. Chair Spearman? Here. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Please make sure, and I'll do the same, you turn your phones off or on vibrate so that they don't rattle uh, while we're in committee meeting. And another reminder uh, to all those who testify, it is unlawful for anyone to knowingly represent false information when testifying to a legislative committee. And myself or any member of the committee uh, can ask you to, for proof to document your testimony. So we have a couple of bills this morning, uh, and so we'll try to go in order as much as we can. Uh, Assembly Bill 147, Assemblywoman Marzola. Uh, the measure revises provisions relating to dentistry. Okay. Is anyone here from the Board of Dentistry? Okay. All right. Okay. Begin when you're ready. Good morning, Chair, and thank you for hearing Assembly Bill 147 this morning, Chair, and all of the committee members. I'm Elaine Marzola, representing Assembly District 21. I am here to present Assembly Bill 147, which concerns dentistry. Joining me today is Eddie Ablisser from Tri Strategies, who will provide some general background information as well as information on the bill. During the legislative interim period, I had the honor of serving on the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Commerce and Labor. We heard presentations on Nevada's healthcare workforce and how we can make healthcare more accessible for all our residents. In particular, we learned about expanding and modernizing oral health and doctors of dentistry, some of the ancillary services that can assist our community, communities with access to care and quality of care, and the convenience of accessing a trained and highly certified dental professional in Nevada. Chair, with your permission, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Ablisser to give you specific details on the bill and answer any questions that you and the committee may have. Thank you. Begin when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Eddie Ablisser with Tri Strategies. Today, on behalf of uh, the Nevada Dental Association, we had the privilege of working on this uh, piece of legislation, modernization of dentistry over the interim. Um, over the interim, we talked about a variety of issues and topics that really confronted um, consumers that were struggling with access to oral health care throughout the state. As you can see from our um, CDC uh, rankings, we struggle in overall health care approach throughout all the state, along with um, our oral health issues. Doctors of dentistry, as we uh, refer to ourselves as or themselves as trained, qualified, focused on helping Nevadans live healthier uh, lives through interprofessional collaboration and integrated healthcare, which is really important, especially in the aspects of this bill, because there's four elements in this bill that I'll go through briefly. Um, this bill increases more access throughout our urban and rural communities um, for a variety of needs that individuals struggle with, um, particularly in oral health care, which affects so much of the entire health system. AB 147, the first portion of this bill, deals with provider of health care. Um, in Section 1, we are adding dental hygienists and dental therapists into NRS to be included as a provider of health care. There's a little, tons of value in providing this, particularly with insurance as well as coordination of care and access and the definition of what a hygienist and a therapist can do in collaborative care for oral health. The second part of this bill is our teledentistry bill. Teledentistry, um, telehealth currently occurs in statute and many uh, oral health providers have um, functioned underneath the current telehealth statute. We believe that there needs to be more nuance with teledentistry, particularly around how a consumer is seen um, by their provider. And so in uh, sections 2 through 14, 20 through 25, and 30 through 39, we were revising statute to define that teledentistry is just to diagnose, treat, educate, manage, and consult. Really a limited scope, but really important for those that can't access a oral health practitioner. They have to be licensed in the state of Nevada. One of the biggest um, issues that we've been working on is this idea of how a relationship through teledentistry gets established. Um, many of the dentists and doctors of dentistry 
uh, hygienists and therapists have articulated that it's important, um, it's essential. All of our associations have said that establishing that initial relationship to review the mouth, review the bones, review the gums, see if there's any medical conditions that might affect an individual. So establishing it through a bona fide relationship and then continuing through a teledentistry relationship is appropriate only for procedures that are approved and, and necessary under scope of care. Um, we do have in this bill exceptions for emergencies, an individual who has an abscess or some sort of growth that they need to get checked out immediately far away from an oral health care provider. We believe an emergency situation is important. And we've learned about a lot of tele or public health programs that utilize teledentistry, particularly with uh, checkups on children in programs that don't have access to oral health care. Getting them in to actually be seen initially is an important piece. And these health, uh, public health programs are extremely supportive of this language. And those are at counties um, that work in Boys and Girls Club, as an example. Uh, we have language that ensures that the patient they're seeing is the patient that they're, they're actually treating. Um, emergency pre procedures inform written consent, which was a very sticky point when we worked on this in the assembly. Uh, HIPAA and record keeping, referral care for, ex for the geographically accessible or inability to access for ongoing care and emergencies. Um, we have regulations that the board's gonna need to work on prescriptions over teledentistry. Again, in those emergent situations that might need something immediately to really remedy that situation. And then continuing ed, education courses, uh, procedures on securing the electronic storage of record, um, medical facilities notifying patients if that it's accessible and DHHS oversight, as well as uh, licensure requirements. We mirror a lot of this from the telehealth statute. Some of the changes, again, are because oral health is unique and different, and it's inside the mouth, and there's a lot of need to look inside the mouth that can't be viewed through a teledentistry approach. The third portion of this bill is immunization portion. Uh, we have found that through the Commonwealth Fund that uh, we rank one of the lowest of per thousand residents in administration of vaccines or, or immunizations. Um, we saw that over the pandemic, the uh, doctors of dentistry, dentistry were called on to help with a lot of the immunizations and vaccinations that were needed in communities across Nevada, and they stepped up and they served. Um, but that has been, you know, thus taken away in statute. They're not allowed to give, I mean, a doctor of dentistry is not allowed to give a shot for immunization or vaccination. And so this bill uh, revises that. We put approved courses before the board. A uh, special license that can allow a doctor of dentistry to do this function um, and how to administer it, as well as working with their hygienists and therapists um, who work under guidance of the dentist. The immunizations must have a standing order from a, a doctor of dentistry, a physician, PA, or APRN. Procedures on how to dispose of the equipment, emergency plans, uh, Board of Health reporting, CDC best practices that are established. Uh, the uh, gained written informed consent, review of medical history, uh, HIPAA and, and uh, record keeping, as well as continuing education and finally outline what is unpre unprofessional conduct in, the, in administration of vaccination or immunizations. Final portion of this bill is considered the dental home. Um, to be very brief on dental home and not to confuse the subject, it's the uh, American Dental Association's language for referring to a primary care physician in the oral health field. We call it a dental home as a way to establish that every individual has their primary care uh, dentist that they get to see. And so in the bill, we've established in section 19.5 that um, any oral health professional who has that initial um, visit with a minor must refer to ongoing, um, uh, ongoing care, which is a dental home. And if they're in a rural portion of the state that don't, doesn't have access to a dentist readily available, we, we've designed that there's a virtual dental home of a team, team of professionals that can connect with that minor to ensure that they're getting care. One of the things that this fixes is that we see in a lot of communities, children going in for that initial checkup because they have a toothache or maybe um, decay in their tooth, there, there's no follow-up. There's no ongoing care for these children. And so the dental home establishes that that professional makes that referral immediately and that there's an established dental home so that the family and the children know where to go and have access to an ongoing care provider. 
Uh, we believe that these four provisions will significantly increase the access and convenience to care through doctors of dentistry. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Assemblywoman Elaine Marzola for all of her diligent work in working with stakeholders across the entire um, sphere of oral health, and we appreciate your time and available for any questions. Thank you. Any other presenters? No, we're ready for questions. Thank okay. you, Chair. All right. Questions? Uh, Senator Stone. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, in order for some of these uh, the subordinates of the dentist to uh, administer administ uh, immunizations, uh, they have to work under a dentist or a physician or a nurse practitioner. So do you foresee a, uh, a dental hygienist working in a dentist's office where the dentist doesn't want to do immunization and has some collaborative agreement with a physician and providing immunizations in a dental office where a dentist isn't actually overseeing the administration? Eddie Ablisser, for the record, um, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Stone, I, I think one of those can be fixed. Just go to red. Go Thank to you. Red. Um, I think part, part of it can be fixed uh, through regulation with the board. Obviously, a physician can administer immunization, and um, if there is an agreement for a dental hygienist to work underneath a physician for um, any purpose, I think their license is tied to the the doctor of dentistry, so there, there's more than likely has to be some sort of regulation put in place in order for that dynamic to happen, uh, because our dental hygienists work very closely with the dentist or and dental therapists. And then just as a follow-up, uh, I would assume that if a dentist or a hygienist is um, administering immunizations, that there needs to be a um, a crash cart as it relates to uh, uh, immunization effects such as you know anaphylactic shock, uh, allergies. I assume they have to carry uh, epinephrine, uh, antihistamines, and things like that. Is, yes. uh, I think I, I saw something in the bill about that. Yeah, Eddie Avalosa, for the record, Senator Stone, you're absolutely right. Um, this was a core provision of moving forward on this topic is that there's so many emergencies that happen when immunizations or vaccinations are given to an individual because of per certain allergies. So the emergency procedures stipulated in the bill and then developed by the board is essential. Thank you. Additional questions? Okay, so I just have a couple. I want to go back to, uh, I think it's like maybe the second or third slide uh, where you have all the percentages. Um, Nevada ranks. Yep, I'm heading there. Um, Did I pass it? Um, <clears throat> so I'm looking at 50th for access and affordability. Talk to me about that. And, and by the way, uh, Senator Woman, I'm glad that we got there a few years ago. One of our former colleagues, uh, Senator Ratty, uh, bought a bill to bring a uh, dental hygienist into the fold. And, you know, it was like, you know, we just said the sky is falling or something. Anyway, yeah. Um, Eddie Abelson, for the record, Madam Chair, uh, and I appreciate you bringing up uh, Senator Ratty, because many portions of this bill are directly correlated to her former bill, the teledentistry portion, the, um, uh, the dental hy hygiene and dental therapist being included in the um, uh, provisions of provider of health care, as well as the dental home. We added immunization, which was another concept that was introduced last session, didn't get a hearing, and merged those together and refined it with stakeholders. Um, you know, working with the Commonwealth Fund, you know, this obviously changes over time. Um, what we saw, because Nevada is such a big landmass, because we have two ginormous urban centers and very rural and then frontier portions of the state, access to healthcare in general, we struggle with in this state. And I know it's something that you all have been working on diligently to provide various ways for access. What we're concerned with, of course, is the, the role that um, oral health has in an individual's life and the effects that oral health has. Uh, someone struggling with um, teeth decay, with bone disease, with um, gum disease, can have detrimental long-term compound effects on the individual's whole physical system. And without access and true access to um, providers, uh, these individuals are, not, individuals are not being seen, which brings up to the point of uh, teledentistry. We think that the teledentistry and the immunization portions create more of an access um, as well as dental home, ensuring that every minor has a primary care dentist. Follow up. Um, so when we talk about teledentistry, talk to me about the spectrum. What does that look like? 
What's been, ex uh, Eddie Abelson, for the record, what's been explained to me, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee uh, from our doctors of dentistry is that uh, oftentimes individuals have their dentist and they are, um, those dentists are not able to negotiate with um, their panels, their insurance groups that they're part of in order to provide services. So if you get a call, if you're on a trip and you call your dentist and say, I've got a tooth pain or something sticking out of my, my gum, can you take a look at it? Uh, generally, those, those visits are sort of a service that, that most doctors of dentists provide. They rarely charge for them because there's not codes, there's not relationship or an agreed upon dynamic. And so codifying it in statute that allows dentists to do certain very uh, superficial, superficial treatments um, and overview, and especially for the emergencies, provides value to each consumer. Um, de dentists are very clear, and so are dental hygienists. You can't clean teeth over teledentistry. You can't analyze the gums other than the color, perhaps. You can't feel the texture. You can't touch the tooth and, and recognize what's going on there. Um, there's difficulty on seeing the bone and the density of the bone and, and the x-rays and being in person to look through those pieces. Um, and overall physical health dynamics. So uh, unlike telehealth, which there are even more value um, propositions in place through telehealth, teledentistry is even more um, specific because of the difficulty of what happens inside the oral cavity. So, <clears throat> sorry, tel so teledentistry, I think this may be the last one. So teledentistry is really designed, and I'm looking here 50th access and affordability, so the rural areas and frontier areas gives them more access across the spectrum of dentistry. Yes, no? Eddie Abelson, for the record, I would say for, for the um, ongoing care, pain, um, and prevention um, capture, perhaps, um, not really truly preventative, but to ensure that someone's has access to their dental home, their primary care dentist, to ensure that, that they're um, in a position um, where the dentist can be reimbursed, um, the patient doesn't have to uh, pay an exorbitant amount or go through telehealth that might not have a provider that understands the oral cavity, and uh, those dentists can really give that referral, do a quick treatment plan, and say the next steps. I mean, one of the core things that we want to make sure of is that People neglect their oral health daily. And if they have a chance to talk to someone, not wait in the dentist's office and get a quick overview, do I need to go in and get um, a screening? Do I need to get my x-rays done? Do we need to go ahead and, and take a look at this abscess? It could be done right away in the moment in terms of that referral. Um, Senator Stone. Thank you. Yes, uh, just a final question. With all uh, dentists or dental staff that are going to be utilizing telehealth, will they all be licensed Nevada professionals, including their subordinates, at any time doing telehealth? And is there any requirement that the dentist providing the telehealth has a bricks and mortar facility in Nevada? Uh, Eddie Abelson, for the record, one of the provisions in, um, Senator Stone, one of the provisions in this bill is that every dentist, dental professional must be licensed through our board of dental examiners. And moreover, they have to go through training, special licensure with the board and subject themselves to the regulations that the board puts forth. Um, you know, oftentimes we know that there are, uh, there are good providers that don't necessarily utilize bricks and mortar, but establishing it in person to some extent at some point, even in an emergency where that relationship might be established, we know that the regulation is going to move to a point that that person needs to see someone in person um, right. for the ongoing relationship. But there are, there are things that can happen that um, are valuable after that person has established the relationship in person. Okay, so I take that, that you need to be licensed, but you don't necessarily have to have a bricks and mortar facility in Nevada. Not necessarily. Eddie Abelson, for the record. Thank you. Senator Buck. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I was wondering about the, uh, a lot of times, sometimes there's mobile teledentistry or mobile dentistry and so how would that play into this? Thank you, um, Eddie Abbas for the record. Senator Buck, great question. And it's something that 
the Nevada Dental Association, Association is very proud of. Um, one of the things that many of our dentists do in some of our rural community, frontier communities are um, our Native American um, um, colonies that are hard to reach. We have these mobile units that go out and provide that in care. So, um, you know, one of the perfect examples I'm going to use is Dr. White has been just phenomenal in reaching out with um, uh, really hard to reach uh, communities. He goes out in person with his dental um, hygienist. They do cleanings, they do oversight, they do scope uh, screening. They establish that relationship. The one thing that why he's so interested in that is they struggle with that next connection, that ongoing care, because now he drives back to Reno and they're 200 plus miles away and they can't access and there's no one else there, right? There's no other provider in that region. So if we were able to establish teledentistry, uh, many of these dentists and dental hygienists can at least do a check-in to make sure that if there's ongoing need, we'll establish something, get them to come to a city that, that has a provider if there's an emergent issue. Additional questions? Um, number two, teledentistry is used to diagnose, treat, and educate. <clears throat> and I want to go back to something you said, um, examining the gums and that sort of thing. So. How do you do that with teledentistry? Um, Eddie Abelser, for the record, and that's a great question, and this is a question that we've had ongoing conversations with other stakeholders about you simply can't. You cannot review the gum, the bone, um, some of the decay, some of the issues behind the tooth in the oral cavity. There's things that cannot happen, and those should not happen through teledentistry because um, a dentist needs to see that individual in person. Um, that's why the, the very limited scope of what they can do um, as established through the board is gonna be very important. Um, and that's why we also encourage that bona fide relationship to be established so that the doctor of dentistry knows their patient, knows what's going on with them, and knows all the medical concerns happening to them. So <clears throat> anybody in here like to go fishing? Anybody like to go fishing? Cause I'm gonna open up a can of worms, okay? <laughs> Um, <clears throat> because the question that comes to me is kind of like the questions that we had with, um, dare I say, Warby Parker, um, and the relationship that the doctors of, of optometry have with people who are ordering glasses um, online, et cetera. And so I'm trying to see if there is a nexus uh, between someone having a relationship with brick and mortar and then someone uh, getting some dental services, teledentistry online. So is there any, um, is there any connection? Is there any nexus? Is there any breakdown? Just, just, just help me with that. And committee, please excuse me if I brought up nightmares, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Eddie Abelson, for the record, and I hope this is not one of those nightmares, uh, Senator. We believe that the nexus exists in the ongoing and continued care for the patient. Um, again, what we have found is that most patients, most clients see their dentist more often than their um, physician. They're coming in for cleanings, they're coming in for screenings, they're coming in for their annual checkups twice a year. There is an opportunity to see that individual. The other thing that we have found, even though they see their dentist more often, they're also not following up on, um, on minor or medium pains that they might experience. We often go through the day and neglect um, drink a hot coffee, don't recognize the pain in the back of our tooth, and we don't report it, we don't engage, because the burden of engaging with that dentist and going to the office and being in person after you know, that relationship is established is a lot. So if we had the opportunity to have consults, right, to um, connect for 15 minutes with a dentist to say, hey, I'm experiencing significant pain in my molar, this ongoing relationship, we believe it's continuity of care, we believe it's preventative because it allows the patient more access to their dentist in order to do these ch intermittent check-ins. And that's the value of teledentistry. Also, in an emergency situation, that ability to go to a trained professional versus just a telehealth and say, hey, I've got this huge abscess above my gum, what do I do? Now you have a dentist who's trained in the oral cavity and understanding what it is and can, can help diagnose what it might be and give them guidance on the next steps. That's the nexus. We don't see teledentistry replacing 
dentist in person in Nevada, simply we don't see that as a scope of practice that actually works in any situation. Um, we know that your mouth is very important to the overall health system of your body, and if you're not being fully considered and all aspects of your gums, your bones, your teeth, your oral cavity is, is reviewed, um, it could be detrimental long term to your health. Um, one last question. So, um, so we had we had a bill several sessions ago, adopt a vet. Um, so, how does this? Because I know a lot of the veterans who use this particular provision. How many um, how many dentists do you know that are participating in that? Because one of the things that immediately comes to mind is there's a there's a primary care. Uh, with respect to the dentistry, but then there's something else that um, <clears throat> a friend of mine uh, called and asked me one time, so there was a recommendation for braces or some type of alignment, but their dentist didn't do that at all. And so how do we reconcile whatever this is doing with that form of teledentistry? Am I making sense to you? Sure. Okay. Eddie Alves, for the record, uh, Senator Spearman, um, you know, doctors of dentistry um, have a baseline skill and foundational understanding of, of the mouth. And then there's specialties. We have orthodontists that specialize in the alignment of your jaw, your mouth, your teeth. Um, you have pediatrics, you have uh, surgeons, you have a variety of different specialties. Similarly, in healthcare, when a general practitioner doesn't understand certain functions, they refer out. They refer to specialists and then they create continuity of care, a collaborative approach to ensure that that individual's full physical health is coordinated and aligned. So the general practitioner, their primary care physician, is working with the specialist to make sure that whatever need of that consumer is being addressed. Same way, in the same vein, oral health care practitioners, doctors of dentistry, refer out. They refer to um, ongoing care with a specialist, whether it's surgeon, um, you know, a specialist in root canal, those types of relationships are pivotal. For orthodontists, that is an important piece, but it's also the recognition that that in-person view for all of these, you can't determine if, if a tooth is dying and you need a root canal without seeing that tooth and reviewing it in person, right? And then going to the specialist. Those are important reviews that ensure the next steps. And so um, with veterans, with individuals, uh, our homeless population, which the Nevada Dental Association has a homeless outreach and provides care, there's hard to reach populations that generally neglect their oral health. And if we can move forward with the dental home, which is such an important piece to establish that individuals have that relationship, but then that access where they're able to get seen, treated, um, and then the ongoing ability to see that same dentist or that referral dentist uh, would be invaluable. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? I'm having difficult understanding, but I'll come back to the, the anyway. Uh, any additional presenters? I think we have a couple people on the phone. You have anyone on the phone? We don't have any additional presenters. Okay. Elaine Marzello for the record. Okay. And so with that, if you all step back, we'll open up testimony and support. Yes, ma'am. Chair Spearman, members of the committee, Sasha Stevenson for the record, here representing the American Association of Orthodontists. We are fully in support of the language as it is presented to you in this bill, and we want to thank the sponsor for working with us and for her inclusivity during the process and working out many of the questions that you're asking on the record today. Thank you. Just a quick question. Orthodontists participate in teledentistry? The orthodontists are participating in the initial consultations, and obviously any orthodontic work that would be done during teledentistry, we would hope that there would be, through this bill, there would be a licensed orthodontist consulting throughout the process. Give me, give me an example. Is, is there a diagnosis? Is orthodontist is brick and mortar? Where does so teledentistry come in? Brick and mortar, or as you pointed out earlier, the mobile option. Um, but yeah, certainly don't want anything that's going to move the teeth or adjust the bone structure without an in-person exam. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else in support? BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in support of AB 147, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. <coughs> Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, so we will move now to opposition. Anyone here in Carson City? Anyone in uh, Las Vegas in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 147, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Uh, BPS, let's hold off on phone lines first and let's start here in Carson City. I hope, hope that doesn't confuse whoever's on the phone. So we start in Carson City and move down to Las Vegas, and then we'll move to the phone line. Is that okay? All right, let's start in Carson City. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. For the record, my name is William Horn. I'm with Strategies 360, representing Smile Direct Club. I want to th thank the bill sp sponsor, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Marzola, for her work on, on this piece of legislation. Unfortunately, today I have to come in opposition on this as it limits, limits the scope in tele-dentistry, uh, particularly for our client, uh, Smile Direct. Um, also have on the line, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Solicer will uh, speak on how tele-dentistry and how Smile Direct Club uh, provides care for patients and how it actually works, uh, as opposed to some of the uh, representations that were made earlier during the presentation. This morning. Also, there will be on the line as backup is uh, Ray Colas. And, uh, but just for uh, questions that the committee may have uh, that he'll be able to uh, answer. Again, um, the work that uh, Assemblywoman Marzola did over the interim is appreciated. Unfortunately, um, Smile Direct was not uh, included in those d discussions. Uh, probably it just. Uh, was missed as that area of dentistry and that practice, but uh, make no mistakes, those doctors that, that, uh, that care for patients that using teledentistry through Smile Direct and other t types of um, that product of molding teeth that many of you have seen on, online, um, they are licensed dentists in the state of Nevada. I'll repeat, they are licensed dentists, just like all the other dentists that have the brick and mortar, brick and mortar uh, offices as well. They, um, they are answerable to the uh, Board of Dentistry uh, for their scope of care and uh, whether patients are properly being cared for, uh, ex et cetera. They're no different than any other dentist that's licensed in the state of Nevada. Um, before passing it on to Dr. Sulzer, I'd like to say that that when when a patient is presents to uh, teledentistry, uh, there are steps that Dr. Sulzer uh, Sulitzer will walk you through on how that actually works. Smile Direct has been in Nevada for for years, and what was missing in the presentation earlier was presentation from the dental board, the board that we charge with overseeing licensed dental health care providers. Um, they were not part of the initial hearing in, uh, in the assembly. Uh, they uh, did not come here. It's the board who will come and say, we have a problem in this area of dentistry. and uh, We need to fix it. We have these issues that we are observing uh, that need to be addressed, but we haven't seen that. And so in this particular section that's dealing with teledentistry, particularly in, in section 10, I think is, you know, a solution looking for a problem because there was no presentation that was given that even suggests that the outcomes for those who use teledentistry 
and companies like SmileDirect are any different than those who present in person. Um, the Dental Association, who uh, Mr. Elba, sir, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, Eddie, um, they seem to be taking the role of being the dental board, um, and they are an association. So uh, the question that um, is, you know, should be asked is, what is the need to, as uh, Eddie mentioned, limit the scope of these licensed dentists as opposed to others? Um, with that, Madam uh, Chair, I'd like to pass this on to Dr. Jeffrey Solitzer. Uh, for, uh, he's the Chief Clinical Officer for Smile Direct. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Is it okay that I speak now? Um, yes, please begin. Okay. So my name is Dr. Jeffrey Solitzer. Thank you for your time. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer at Smile Direct Club. I'm a general dentist. I've been a dentist for over 38 years, and I'm licensed in six states. Um, I wanted to make it clear that the mission at Smile Direct Club and its affiliated Nevada licensed dentist and orthodontists is to increase access to care for services that uh, they seek um, and that's access to quality care at an affordable price, which is a critical component of our model. Uh, our model provides uh, clear aligners, which are these devices that move teeth incrementally, very safely and very efficiently uh, through a teledentistry platform that provides these services at, as I said, 60% less cost. So we can do this at a $2,000 price versus a four, well, actually a six to $7,000 price for mild to moderate crowding and spacing. And that's the key. The key is that our affiliated Nevada licensed dentists and orthodontists stay in their lanes. They manage cases, they prescribe, manage and direct the care from the very beginning to the very end of treatment uh, within that environment, mild to moderate crowding and spacing. If those cases are more advanced, they're more complicated, then those cases are referred to local brick and mortar orthodontists to be treated with braces, if that's appropriate, or any other treatments that that local orthodontist believes is important. Um, in our environment, again, access to care is critical. We heard the gentleman representing the Nevada Dental Association talk about access to care, but yet when you think about it, um, it's limiting access to care because they place stipulations and limitations on people or doctors who want to deliver clear line of therapy, which is bizarre. Um, not sure if I understand why, if it is safe, for emergencies to deliver care through teledentistry and safe for public health programs. And they can diagnose and treat through those programs through teledentistry or through emergencies. Why can't clinical uh, services be delivered for clear aligners for mild to moderate crowding and spacing through the same, same type of platform safely and effectively? And, and it's just, Un, unexplained why um, in, um, this section 10 limits this to only these types of services. It just doesn't make any sense and clearly is anti-competitive. Um, and that's where the uh, Nevada Dental Association is going. Um, I do take, um, I take some issues with how the uh, representative of the uh, Dental Association, who's not a dentist, to suggest that you cannot screen for periodontal disease, dental caries, and other uh, oral pathologies in the mouth using teledentistry. We've been doing it for over 20 years effectively and safely. Uh, there are studies that show you can diagnose, you can screen for certain diseases and, and, and problems and issues and concerns, and oftentimes, through our platform, our Nevada licensed dentists and orthodontists do refer to local brick and mortar dentists or dental specialists for follow-up. They also will refer patients out for x-rays if x-rays are indicated, 
X-rays are not indicated across the board, nor does the American Dental Association or the FDA allow for X-rays to be taken on every case just because you want to take X-rays. There must be a diagnostic and therapeutic advantage for taking X-rays in order to take X-rays. So X-rays are taken and asked for if indicated and if necessary. And again, if you can, if, if it is gaining any kind of diagnostic or therapeutic advantage. So in the end, we believe that minorities and lower income uh, residents of Nevada are going to be hurt by the passing of this bill. Given that amendment, that, that section 10 that limits the use of teledentistry, and it, when we believe uh, the affiliated dentist in Nevada, the licensed dentist in Nevada believe it is an arbitrary and anti-competitive uh, statement and unnecessary to limit this type of situation, considering that there have been no adjudicated dental board complaints against any Smile Direct Club affiliated dentists or orthodontists in the seven and a half years that we've been in uh, doing uh, uh, clear line of therapy in Nevada with our affiliated dentists and orthodontists. We've treated over 19,000 people, which has created a savings of over $76 million. That is very important. And I don't see why we would want to see this go away just because the Nevada Dental Association wants to act anti-competitively along with the American Association of Orthodontists. Thank you. And I stand for questions, if any. Committee questions? Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. So I was wondering, why would you not want an in-person initial consultation um, just to rule out mouth cancer or something that could potentially be underlying? Thank you, that's a great question. And what happens through a teledentistry exam, so you understand, is that the dentist conducting that teledentistry exam review the same identical clinical information that they review when they conduct a similar exam in, in person. They review the chief complaint, the informed consent, medical history, patient's dental history, 3D images, they review photographs, they review any necessary x-rays that are indicated. So they are reviewing and any narratives that a local dentist might have supplied or any history of any concerns when they conduct and complete their final assessment and appropriate treatment plan for that patient. They can, and we do identify mouth cancers, um, cancerous or, or uh, suspicious lesions in the mouth through teledentistry it can be done. And you may have, you're probably aware that oral pathology, general pathology has been done, di, uh, dermatology has been done effectively through telehealth, uh, radiology has been effective through, tele, to, through telehealth. So I'm not suggesting that an in-person exam is not appropriate. An in-person exam is, is, is fine if the patient would choose to do that. Uh, in, in an environment where you're doing clear a line of therapy for mild to moderate crowding and spacing, an in-person exam is not necessary. And if it is indicated, an in-person exam is ordered. And no treatment would be given unless that in-person exam took place. For instance, if during the uh, exam through teledentistry, the treating doctor perceives a potential issue or concern through a screening process for periodontal or gum disease, the patient will be placed on a uh, periodontal clearance, is what it's called. And that patient cannot go any further for treatment in the orthodontic environment through teledentistry until they're seen by a brick and mortar dentist and rule out periodontal disease. And then they can deliver any of the therapy that's necessary for the periodontal disease and then begin orthodontic treatment through teledentistry. So the process is built in already without this amendment, 10, this, excuse me, section 10 that doesn't need to be in this bill. That's our issue with this bill. With, there's, there's no reason to mandate an in-person first. It's akin to towing a Tesla six miles with a horse first before you turn on the engine, the battery. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's not necessary. Senator Stone? Yeah, thank you, Doctor, for your, uh, your presentation and ex explaining uh, what your Smile Center does. But 
So w when people come to you, they're not coming to you because they have a toothache or they're not coming to you because they have an abscess or coming to you because they have some um, cosmetic issues with their bite, with their teeth, and they're looking for, I assume, a, a lower cost alternative to orthodontics. So um, how often would you say that when you interact with a patient that you end up having to refer them to a dentist for a, a in-person um, evaluation because of some other pathologies. And I think you mentioned that you've been in business for seven years. Have, have you had any uh, malpractice uh, suits against you that relate to the fact that you're doing everything by telehealth rather than in-person uh, interviews? And uh, uh, how accessible are you uh, if there is a, a complication uh, with a patient and how do you handle those complications? Okay, so f first, well, give, give us your name again. Sorry, into, give us your name. Uh, your name. Your name. Oh, sorry. This is Jeffrey. Sel apologize, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Seltzer responding. So, um, you you had suggested that it might be malpractice suits. There are no malpractice suits that uh, are, were in Nevada to date for those seven years. Um, and again, you, there was a three-part question, and I'm so sorry. I, I, the, can you again get to the ask the first part too, so I can address them one at a time? It might make it easier. Yeah, I was addressing that uh, when people are referred to you, they're not really being referred to you because they have some pathologies, a toothache, an abscess, or they're coming to you for a specific reason. If they have some cosmetic issues with their teeth, they grind their teeth, they have a tooth that's uh, out of alignment, and and you have a uh, a process that you, you've you uh, invented, advocated, that uh, can provide for basically teeth straightening at a, at a reduced cost. You said you save, what, $76 million in, in cost, especially to low-income people. And um, so I would assume that people come to you not because, again, they're, they have a, a, patholo a pathology other than a, a cosmetic issue that needs to be uh, entertained. And, and I, I would assume that if you discover something via an x-ray or you see something even on telehealth, I mean, obviously, if you see an abscess on telehealth, you're going to refer them, obviously, to a, to a, to a dentist. And then um, maybe I'll just follow up again. And I want you to elaborate on why you feel that this is um, purposefully anti-competitive. Sure. Um, it, it is purposely anti-competitive because it is isolating and stopping the model that Smile Direct Club, Byte, and other companies have that are direct to consumer. And again, not do it yourself, but direct to consumer. It limits the ability for us to conduct business. In fact, it stops us from doing business in the state, as well as many other companies like us that do these types of services, as well as other companies Reset Smile and others that do other services through a teledentistry model. So that's why it's anti-competitive. And you'll notice that they allow for, the language allows for uh, emergencies, which is interesting. If it's safe for emergencies, why wouldn't it be safe for clear therapy, number one? And number two, if it's safe for public health programs, why wouldn't it be safe for any program in a private environment? It just doesn't make any sense. So that's your indication that it is clearly anti-competitive. Um, so I just wanted to address that. And I think you had a third part to this. If you, you asked the third question, if I remember. I, I think you've pretty much answered it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Senator Pazina. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I guess I would ask what percentage of clients um, ask for a refund, and if so, is there a request for a non-disclosure agreement? Thank you. Uh, this is Dr. Jeffrey Solitzer. Um, the I don't know what the percentage is of patients that ask for refunds, but let me explain a refund policy. Uh, patients are entitled to a, a full refund 30 days after they up to after up to 30 days after they've received their clear aligners. Uh, they can get a full refund. Um, if they're interested, as they go on past the 30, and there's no questions asked, it's an automatic full refund. If 
they go beyond the 30 days, let's say it's a six month treatment plan, and in month four or month five, they're unhappy with the results, then on a case by case basis, it will be reviewed. And if the patient feels that they've been dissatisfied with the results, the doctor is also dissatisfied or uncomfortable with the procedures, the patient maybe not have been compliant, whatever, then the patient would be entitled to either a prorated refund or a full refund, depending upon the circumstances. But within 30 days, it's a full refund, no questions asked, no other conditions. Um, as far as a non-disclosure, there is no non-disclosure um, on any of the policies that I mentioned when it comes to the 30 days. Um, if there is a refund granted beyond the 30 days and in a circumstance where um, the patient was given, say, a full refund, and this is consistent with the language that the American Association has put out to their membership, as well as dentists with the Nevada Dental Association, they will then ask for uh, patients to um, not disclose the conditions of the um, uh, refund, but it's not a non-disclosure in that they can complain to the dental board, they can complain to um, uh, uh, any other jurisdiction, any other regulatory environment, so. Thank you, and as a follow-up, um, what percentage would you say are asking for that refund or return? in general, like 5%, 50%, just a, a general guesstimate. Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Salitz here again. I'm not sure the exact number, but if you're asking me to guess, I'd say it's probably 5%, maybe. I don't know for sure the exact number. Probably less than 5% because it's a large amount of people that we uh, have treated. The, the platform at Smile Direct Club is close to treating now in the seven plus years it's been in existence. It's affiliated dentists, over 2 million patients, so close to 2 million patients. It's less than 5%, for sure. Um, so um, I, I, have, I have a question, because you said you're a licensed orthodontist uh, here in Nevada, yes? Or licensed general practitioners uh, who are dentists, or just, is there just general practitioners, or are there also orthodontists? licensed here in Nevada? This is Jeffrey Solitzer. Um, there are licensed orthodontists and general dentists in Nevada okay. who are treating these patients who are residents of Nevada. Okay. So the, so the question, question I would have, um, I was reading here that the American Orthodontist Association has, um, has recommended that patients have orthodontic treatment and uh, direct and ongoing in-person supervision of a licensed orthodontist. How many do you have here in Nevada, and would that be enough to cover um, your patients in Nevada? Uh, this is what, what I'm getting at, because I'm, 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 I'm still trying to reconcile the differences in teledentistry in diagnosing and treating and then what you all are doing. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to see where there's a, is there a distinct difference or is there just a moderate distant difference? I, and, and, and excuse me, I'm you know, rather pedestrian about this, so humor me. Sure, this is Jeffrey Seltzer speaking once again. Um, I, there's no difference between the teledentistry platform in the way Smile Direct Club affiliated dentists and orthodontists deliver the care as they would in their traditional brick and mortar environment in Nevada or in any other state. Um, and it's not any different than the way a general dentist in Nevada would deliver clear aligner therapy using clear aligners such as these. Um, there is no mandate by state regulations, dental board, Nevada dental board, that a general dentist cannot deliver clear aligner therapy. Um, for patients. Uh, if, you, if a dentist is licensed in Nevada, he or she is eligible and capable of doing clear aligner therapy without the uh, direction or support of an orthodontist. So there are orthodontists and general dentists that conduct clear aligner therapy and orthodontic therapy in Nevada 
in the traditional setting, and it's no different, the regulations are no different, nor should they be. We believe the standard of care for patients, for doctors delivering clear aligner therapy through clear aligner should be identical and same as it is in the, in the uh, traditional environment. Thank you. Just some questions? Okay, is there anyone else here in uh, Carson City or in Las Vegas in opposition? VPS, let's go to the phones. Anyone on the phones in opposition? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 147, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, so we'll move now to those uh, testifying neutral. Anyone neutral? I don't see anyone here. I don't see anyone in um, Las Vegas. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 147, please press star 9 or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Superwoman Mazzola. Thank you, Chair, and we will be brief. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for you, Chair, and the committee taking the time to hear Assembly Bill 147, and I believe Mr. Ablisser has a couple remarks to make as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the committee, Eddie Avalos, for the record. On behalf of the Nevada Dental Association, and, and a couple things I just want to address. The Nevada Dental Association truly believes that our board of dental examiners should be and must be the um, body that oversees, that directs, that guides um, all aspects of the profession and ensures that our practitioners are, are acting accordingly. Uh, in that, in Section 13, there's direct language that says the board shall adopt regulation regarding all aspects of teledentistry, including practice and scope. Uh, we believe that that conversation around all aspects of education, um, you know, screening, treatment, um, uh, uh, referral should be included within the regs that are produced from the board. And we welcome the conversation with all stakeholders from insurance to specialty practices to online teledentistry uh, groups, we think that those are valuable conversations. Uh, I do want to be very specific. I do not, and in the conversations we have had with Smile Direct and other organizations, this bill does not eliminate their ability to serve Nevadans. If a consumer wants to utilize their service and product, they absolutely can and will continue if that is their choice. Um, the intent here is a consumer protection. It is the fact that moving someone's teeth in any direction can have significant effects without fully reviewing all aspects of that oral cavity. Um, I've heard stories that some individuals have come into a general practitioner or general dentist after they had um, movement of the bone that they were dealing with um, disorders and their, their teeth were decaying and it ended up breaking their teeth and creating even more compound issues. If we can address it up front and just ensure that the general practice is consumer safety, that their mouth is okay to be um, molded and changed in such a drastic way, then groups like Smile Direct can continue and they can um, serve individuals that choose that product. This does not eliminate them. This does not prevent them. It simply says if you have a dentist here in the state, have that in-person full comprehensive review so that mouth is protected. Now we understand emergencies happen and that's why we put that provision in there so that in an individual who has something can be addressed in that immediate situation. Thank you. And see if there's no more questions. Um, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 147. Um, and I'd like, to, I'd like to see after this, I'd like to see both parties um, meet with me because I have some questions. Um, so. After we get done with this, let's try to huddle. Okay, it'll, it'll be erratic because of the schedule today, but I really need, I'm not gonna work session it now, okay?
Okay, thank you. Uh, and so we will <clears throat> close the hearing on Assembly Bill 147 and open the hearing on Assembly Bill 153, uh, regulations of the practice of, is it neuropathy? Is that right? So in the big chair, <laughs> Elaine Marzola for the record. Um, yeah, I think you can say it a couple of different ways. <laughs> Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. I'm Stoey Le Marzola and still representing Assembly District 21. <laughs> I am the sponsor of, of Assembly Bill 153, which provides for the regulations of the practice of nephropathy. I have Dr. Nuzo, um, who is appearing via Zoom, and also Connor Kane with me um, to walk the committee through the bill, answer any questions that you may have. Just to give you a little bit of background information, in an effort to increase access to care, nephropathy provides Nevadans with another treatment option for a variety of health conditions. It is a branch of medicine that focuses on the evaluation and treatment of neuromusculoskeletal conditions. Doctors of nephropathy are connective tissue specialists. This measure aims to protect the public from the practice of nephropathy by unqualified and unlicensed persons from unprofessional professional conduct by persons who are licensed to practice nephropathy. As a background, nephropathy was founded in the early 1900s by Dr. Oakley Smith. It is very different from um, chiropractics, which focuses on the spine. Napropaths working with the spine emphasize on underlying ligaments. Napropaths in the United States are licensed as doctors of napropathy in Illinois and in New Mexico and regulated in Ohio. Training of napropath schools typically involves four years of a master's level study. Dr. Nuzo is the first one who founded the first and only U.S. accredited school of napropath. It is called the Southwest University of Napropathic Medicine. Chair, with your permission, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Nuzo so he can go over the um, bill with you. And or Mr. Connor. <laughs> and, if, and, and, and if I could, Chair, with your, with your permission, Assemblywoman. Um, uh, uh, good morning, uh, Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Connor Kane. I'm with Kerr, Nevada. Uh, as, as you heard, we also have Dr. Dr. Patrick Nuzo joining us by Zoom. He's a napropath who founded the Southwest University of Napropathic Medicine and Health Sciences in, in New Mexico, and he's joining us today from, from New Mexico. Uh, so, Chair, with your permission, I would like to uh, quickly walk you through the key provisions of Assembly Bill 153, which we're referring to as the Napropathic Practice Act, and then briefly turn, turn the floor over to Dr. Nuzo so that he could tell you a little bit more about napropathy and answer any questions that uh, you and the committee may have. So here we go. Uh, we're just going to focus on uh, roughly a dozen uh, uh, provisions here, and, and if folks have questions about others, we can, we can go to those sections and, and try to answer those questions. Um, se section 1.06 creates an advisory board to be overseen by the State Board of Health. Section 1.15 defines, defines a napropath as a person who is approved by the division to practice napropathy and who has been issued a license by the division. Section 1.18 defines, defines the practice of napropathy as well as what the term does not include. At a high level, as, as you've heard from the Assemblywoman, nephropathy is the manipulation of tissues, fascia, muscles, and ligaments to bring the bony structure back into alignment. When we turn the floor over to Dr. Nuzo, he'll flesh this out a little bit more. No pun intended. It's also important to note what the term does not include, physical therapy, chiropractic, and massage therapy. Section 1.2 creates the Napropathic Practice Advisory Board, a board appointed by the governor to include three licensed napropaths and two representatives of the public. Section 1.23 outlines when the advisory board should meet. Section 1.26 outlines, outlines that the State Board of Health shall adopt regulations of the advice of the advisory board. Section 1.32 requires napropaths to obtain a license by passing a national examination designated by the State Board of Health. Section 1.35 allows the division to issue a license to a person who meets the requirements set forth in this section upon application, approval, and, and a license fee of $500. Section 1.49 allows for the renewal of, of a license if the applicant meets the requirements outlined in this section and pays a renewal fee of $500. And Section 1.58 outlines the disciplinary, disciplinary action for a NAPR path and determines if an investigation is conducted and the license um, found... Uh, and, and, and essentially, the, the licensee is, re is responsible for all costs that might result from that, from that investigation. Um, so with, with that, if I could, just quickly to, to turn the floor to Dr. Nuzo, who can 
again, f f flesh out a little bit more about what NAPR paths do, and then uh, we're happy to stand, uh, stand ready for questions. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Assemblywoman Marzola. Thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, present uh, in front of the committee this morning. Um, napropathic medicine and chiropractic medicine Sir, can you give us your name? together more than 120 Sir, years ago. Uh, just, can, you, can you give us your first and last name and spell your last name? Okay. I'm Dr. Patrick Nuzo, N-U-Z-Z-O. I'm the president and founder of Southwest University of Napropathic Medicine. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, as I was saying, napropathic and chiropractic medicine started together more than 120 years ago. The founders were actually together. The philosophy, the education of napropathic and chiropractic are almost identical. What's different is what broke the foundation or the founders apart and the way we treat. Um, napropaths are connective tissue specialists, as Assembly Women Marzola uh, spoke of. We treat the connective tissue to bring bony alignment and spinal alignment versus a high velocity adjustment that a chiropractor may use to bring alignment. We are an option for pain that is absolutely needed in Nevada and every other state. With the opioid epidemic uh, that's uh, rampant in this country, um, we need more options of non-pharmacological uh, treatment. Uh, the number two and three reason um, people show up in medical doctor's offices is joint pain and back pain, okay? We are an option, a non-pharmacological option to treat those pains without the use of those drugs and really get significant help to people with their neuromusculoskeletal pain. We do a hands-on manual therapy that really turns people around and helps people to get out of their pain and get out of their disabilities and get back into working into normal lives without the risk of taking um, pharmacological drugs and, and the risk of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, addiction. Um, napropathic medicine and Southwest University of Napropathic Medicine is the first accredited napropathic school in the country. And not only will we bring this profession to the citizens of Nevada, we will bring this school to Nevada and train hundreds of napropathic doctors over the next decades to fulfill the needs of the, of the Nevada uh, citizens in helping them with their pain and their uh, dysfunction in, in uh, musculoskeletal uh, disorders. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Um, you know, the profession has been uh, uh, around in New Mexico now for 20 years. I did all the uh, work to get the license passed in New Mexico 20 years ago. And at that time, that's when they asked me to bring a school. So we got a school here in New Mexico, the same thing we would do in Nevada. Thank you, sir. Committee, questions? Yeah. Vice Chair Lang. Good morning, doctor. It's great to see you again. I um, was fortunately the recipient of one of his demonstration treatments when he was up here at the legislature, and I had partially torn my rotator cuff fly fishing, if you can believe it. But um, it's caused me so much pain, and he did a treatment on me, and where I couldn't raise my arm up, by the time he finished the treatment, I was able to raise my arm all the way up and have full rotation, and it still remained to this day. And so I'm really interested in, in this, and I hope that we pass this bill. Subtle endorsement, <laughs> Senator Daly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a, a couple couple of questions, and I'm just trying to understand completely uh, standing when you're standing this thing up from scratch. So I'm looking at you. So you have an advisory board, and then you have the board, which is State Board of Health, and then within the State Board of Health, there's a division, of Public and Behavioral Health the Department of Human Services. So who's the oversight authority, or how is that hierarchy going to work? because uh, the advisory board seems to be the ones with the expertise that are going to do some of this stuff, but then who has the actual enforcement, oversights, licensing, all that kind of stuff? Is it the board or the division? I'm just trying to understand the hierarchy uh, on that. Uh, th thank you very much uh, for the question, Senator, Senator Daly. I almost called you Assemblyman Daly for a second there. Um, <laughs> would have been an unforced error. 
Um, so, so, so the advisory board e exists just to provide guidance and, and expertise, but, but the state, it's our understanding the State Board of Health is, is ultimately the, the entity that has that oversight and, and enforcement capability, not, not the advisory board. Very good. Thank, thank you. And then I know throughout this you're saying you're going to adopt regulations to put this into place, that into place, all types of different things. Uh, you're going to get an exemption? I know you can't answer that question. I'm just saying none of it works without the regulations according to the, the way I'm reading this whole thing. Final question, and it's just an uh, esoteric uh, question. It says that the person has to have a bachelor's degree in order to um, because get license and all that stuff. I was just wondering why that was a requirement, uh, what type of training it is, because it doesn't appear to be that you're going to medical school or any of these types of things. Not that these people aren't trained, um, but I didn't know why the bachelor degree might be needed. Thank you, Senator, for the question. And I will have um, Dr. Nuzzo talk about the education piece. Yeah, our degree is 190 hours, quarter credit hours past a bachelor's degree. Our degree is on par with that of a chiropractic degree, a physical therapy degree, an acupuncture degree. Um, we uh, need a bachelor's degree in order to get the prerequisites done in the basic sciences. And then again, our, our school is a full 190 quarter credit hours past a bachelor's degree, which makes it a first professional degree and a doctoral level program. Senator Stone. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, doctor, uh, do insurances, uh, private insurances, Medicaid, do they, do they cover your services? Yeah. Every major medical uh, um, insurance company in New Mexico covers napropathic <laughs> treatments, as well as in Illinois. Um, every major employer in the state has napropathic treatments as a covered benefit. The state of New Mexico employees have napropathic treatments as a covered benefit. As a matter of fact, the governor of New Mexico has made it mandatory that if somebody who works for the state is in need of a musculoskeletal surgery, that they go and seek the consulting of a napropath chiropractor or acupuncturist mm -hmm. before they go in and get surgery. We have saved the state numerous su surgeries over the years and uh, we're hoping to be able to do the same thing for the state of Nevada. Okay, so assuming this passes into law in, in Nevada, we're, we're going to have to go through the hoops with private insurance and Medicaid to make uh, Nevada specific uh, to covering your services. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's not as big of an uh, ordeal as you may think. The CPT codes and the diagnosis codes, they're all you know, for physical therapists, chiropractors, acupuncturists, osteopaths, we would use the same exact... Okay. CPT codes and di diagnosis codes. So it's a matter of them accepting once we have the license and putting us in their in their plans. And I assume there's uh, plenty of malpractice carriers. You have to be insured, I assume, there's to malpractice practice. Malpractice carriers, absolutely. Okay. You can't really have your license uh, active in the state of New Mexico without malpractice insurance. So Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. And we are a profession that's over 100 years old, and there has never been a malpractice uh, uh, case brought against the napropath. Senator Buck. Thank you, Chair Spearman. Uh, so as I look at Section 1.29, it says a lot of non-licensed. Um, I just wondered what the, who, who that was written for. Um, non-licensed always kind of concerns me. And secondly, can you contrast for me or draw a contrast of how it, this is different than chiropractic care? Um, I'll answer the part about how it's different than chiropractic care. Um, again, we start from the same um, philosophy, spinal manipulation and spinal alignment. It's just the way we go about it. If you've ever been to a chiropractor, a chiropractor will bring bony alignment by doing a high velocity adjustment. A napropath will take tension findings on the spinal column. This is scientific spinal manipulation. By taking tension findings, we then design a treatment to bring that ligament back into alignment and that bony structure back into alignment without force. If you adjust a bony structure, okay, without taking care of the tissue that's pulling it out of alignment, it will go right back out of alignment within minutes or hours after the adjustment. If you treat the connective tissue that pulls it out of alignment, like a napropath will, it will then stay more in alignment and give the 
the, the patient, the results that they need and they're expecting, uh, you know, from a session uh, in, in manual therapy. And, and if I could, uh, Chair, uh, Senator, to, to your question, and, and Dr. News, I'm not sure if you have the bill, the bill in front of you, but Section 1.29, I think, relates to um, folks who are in a napropathic uh, uh, program who are enrolled and, and not licensed to practice but may engage under the supervision of a licensed napropath. Also, folks who are instructors who, um, you know, have a limited window of uh, period of time. I think it's not more than a month that they can engage in, in those types of uh, uh, services. Dr. News, do you, do you know why that's in the bill or off the top of your head? Could you give us a brief, brief explanation? Well, you know, it, what we put that in in New Mexico is if we wanted to bring in teachers or seminars, NAPRA pass to come in and, and teach continuing education classes. Um, you know, in New Mexico and in Illinois, we need 30 hours of continuing education every year to renew our license. So there aren't that many NAPRA pass in New Mexico when we first started. So we were bringing NAPRA pass in from other parts of the country to teach, and then they would have a, a temporary license without having to get licensed here. I, I believe that's what you're uh, uh, referring to, uh, uh, Senator Buck. Thank you, if I may, one more. So I, I like the idea of this. I know that oftentimes in American medicine, you know, I went to the ER and they want to give you pills, pills, pills. I don't like taking pills. So um, went to a chiropractor and it helped me. And so I can, like my colleague, um, say that anything that doesn't necessarily just rely on giving pills for pain um, but actually fixing the root of the issue, I 100% I like. Thank you. Thank you. I just have, I've, I've seen on uh, TV since I've been here somebody advertising that there's a way to, if you have neuropathy related to like diabetes or something like that, they can fix that. Is that kind of what this does? Um, just you a know, question. Actually, that's, uh, this is Dr. Nuzo. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I think you're talking about um, neuropathies and diabetic neuropathies. And diabetic neuropathies are the inflammation of the nerve channel um, because of uh, you know, the diabetic condition. Now, we treat those conditions, right, because that is soft tissue and that is neurovascular bundle flow, okay? But that's, you know, the treatment of neuropathies is not the practice of nephropathy. Nephropathy is the treatment of neuromusculoskeletal pain. And neuropathies are a part of that um, uh, diagnosis, if you will. People, we treat people all day long who come into the office with, you know, neuropathies in the feet, neuropathies in the legs, neuropathies in the hands. And it's all about, uh, you know, spinal manipulation and bringing circulation to an area, bringing inflammation away from an area. So it's hands-on manual therapy, no pharmaceuticals used whatsoever. Okay, thank you. No additional questions, any, okay. If you step back, we'll open up uh, now for testimony and support. Anyone in support of Assembly Bill 153 here in Carson City in Las Vegas. Don't see anyone moving. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in support of AB 153, please press star nine or raise hand within Zoom to take your place in the queue. Hello. 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 Um, um, can, am I able to? Am I able to speak? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Proceed, please. Give us your name. Oh, okay, great. I didn't know if it was a number of people. Hi, my name is um, Tanya Hagens, and I'm here um, in support, unwavering support for the proposed bill. Um, that seeks to be recognized. Um, do I need to spell my name as well? Yes, ma'am, please. For the record. Mm -hmm. Okay. My first name is Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A, 
last name Hagins, H-A-G-G-I-N-S. Okay. Oh, okay. And I'm providing tes um, testimony of my support once again for the proposed um, AB 153 um, in reference to uh, medication free healing practices into um, mainstream medicine. I am a personal living testimony of the uh, potential of these incredible practices. And um, about six years ago, I suffered a devastating injury to my static nerve uh, during a surgery. Uh, the accident left me with severe nerve damage and intense pain. Um, the conventional medicine approach um, prescribed narcotic medications um, and suggested that I do a surgery that was about $60,000 as the primary treatment options. After meeting with a, a napropath, I chose to explore alternative healing practices. I actually traveled all the way from Cleveland, Ohio to Nevada because we didn't have any in our local area. Um, and I um, came to that, um, that um, practitioner in uh, Nevada and under that care, um, I underwent a comprehensive healing regime. Um, they addressed not only my physical aspects of my injury, but also tapped into um, the healing power of my own body. And I was able to um, avoid taking any more narcotic medications and avoid surgery. And for me, the results were truly remarkable. Doctors had said they weren't even sure if I was ever going to walk again. And going through that treatment, I was able to walk again, and I witnessed gradual and steady improvement in my condition. Um, with each session, I experienced a reduction in pain, enhanced mobility, and a renewed sense of self and well-being. Um, the medication-free approach not only allowed me to avoid potential side effects, but also empowered me to take an active role in my overall healing process. Um, furthermore, that I believe that the medication-free healing practices have been used for centuries um, in various cultures around the world, and they have stood the test of time and have been refined through generations incorporating knowledge and wisdom passed down through the centuries of practice. And I believe that um, in Nevada, by recognizing these practices into the mainstream medicine, we have the opportunity or Nevada has the opportunity to provide patients with a more comprehensive and personalized approach to healing. Mm -hmm. This bill, if passed, will not only expand the range of treatment options available, but also foster a more patient-centered uh, health care system okay. that thank you, respects individual yeah. choices thank you, and can preferences. You, thank you, ma'am. Can you, can you uh, uh, send in the rest of your testimony? Sure, okay. absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Um, BPS, anyone else? moment chair and I'm going to ask those who are um, testifying in opposition yes or whatever uh, let's try to limit it to two minutes okay hello hello hi there hi there hi my name is Bo Hightower I'd like to also testify for this bill, my name is it's spelled B E A U H I G H T O W E R. Um, I'm a licensed chiropractor in Nevada. I'm also a graduate of SUNM. Um, I've personally found that the naturopathic techniques have really added on to my clinical repertoire. It's allowed me to fix injuries that I couldn't do with just chiropractic. Um, I also own a business in Las Vegas. We work with MMA fighters, and uh, our providers are helping those guys get world championships and. Uh, bring belts back to Nevada as well. I think that nephropathy is in a unique position to help with the opiate crisis, to keep patients out of the ERs and out of family medicine doctors. Um, I think it can bring a lot of students to Nevada as they open a school. Um, there's a lot of things that can help both economically, but more from a human aspect to keep people off of these narcotics and to really lighten the load on our family doctors and our ERs. Thank you. Thank you.
Caller ending at 855, you are unmuted and may begin. Caller ending in 855, you may begin when ready. Chair, it looks like the caller is not unmuting to speak. Would you like to proceed and move forward? Yes, we will. And if they're having difficulty, if they come back in, uh, we'll allow their testimony later, okay? Uh, so with that, let's move to those in opposition of uh, Assembly Bill 153. Anyone here? Las Vegas. Anyone on the phones, BPS, in opposition? Chair, we have additional support testimony. Would you like to answer those calls? Uh, yes, yes, I will. One thing for those of you know, one thing that we try to do here because there sometimes there are difficulty with people getting in. Uh, I don't shut people out if they come in at the wrong time. So I think their voice is uh, important. Just saying. BPS. Hello. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, am I on? For the committee? Yes, you are. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair uh, and honorable members of the Commerce and Labor Committee. It is an honor uh, to address you this morning on such an important matter regarding the health of your Nevada constituents. I'm former State Representative Rick Miera, M-I-E-R-A, former Majority Floor Leader and the longest serving chair of education in New Mexico. I've also had the privilege of addressing your state leaders in the chairman training on behalf of the National Conference of State Legislature. What a beautiful state and population. I'm addressing you on behalf of AB 153 regarding the practice of neuropathy. I was privileged to sponsor the neuropathy bill in New Mexico. This legislation has more than surpassed the expectations we predicted. Dr. Nuzio's graduates have been able to successfully treat our population that were unable to receive this needed treatment with a variety of maladies up to and including pain management, the number one complaint in our healthcare field. As a retiree from the Department of Psychiatry at the University of New Mexico, Availability to treatment is paramount in a state that is expansive in size, but lacking professional medical care. In addition, the economic boost to the state, Rapathy was a welcome addition to the healthcare system and continues to be an outpatient relief for the future with treatments for addiction and needed alternatives to therapeutic intervention. Thank you, committee members, for allowing me to speak with you this morning. BBS, anyone else? Yes, Good chair, morning, one Madam moment. Chair. Proceed. Caller. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm former Senator State uh, State Senator Mary Kay Papin. I was also pro tem of the Senate for eight years, uh, and of uh, the Napropathy program uh, bill that passed in the New Mexico State Senate was something that I was very strongly supportive of. I had sciatica so bad that I was going to the doctors to try and get uh, surgery for, my, for, for what I had with my sciatica. And they said, no, I did, really didn't need that, but to go and get this kind of care. 
So I went to Dr. Nuzi, or actually he came to me and said, I think I can help you. I was walking with a cane, and I thought I was going to have to leave the Senate because I was in such pain. And he came and gave me treatments. And today, uh, 20 years later, I am <laughs> pain-free, and I'm still walking. And occasionally when I'm in Santa Fe, because I live in, in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, when I go to Santa Fe, I will go by and get a treatment. Uh, as a precaution. I strongly support what Dr. Nuzo is doing and to be pain-free and drug-free to be able to live a productive life. Thank you so very much. Chair, there are no additional support for testimony at this time. Okay, anyone um, in opposition? Anybody else on the phone lines? Okay, let's move if now. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 153, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, um, I'm actually, I was having a hard time getting through. I am uh, uh, testifying in um, support of this bill, um, if that's okay. Uh, my name is uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify. My name is Dr. Harris Silver. I'm a retired ear, nose, and throat, and head and neck surgeon. And since 2010, I have worked as a drug policy analyst and advocate. And I worked uh, extensively with the New Mexico legislature, uh, helping them uh, with the scourge of addiction in New Mexico for many years. Um, in 2018, I was chair of the New Mexico um, Overdose Reduction and Pain Management Advisory Council Subcommittee on Integrative Pain Management for Acute and Chronic Pain. And uh, one of the uh, modalities that I became most interested in, um, and this, the reason we were doing this is we were looking for alternatives to opioid pain medications. Um, I, uh, I'm sure that most of you are aware that we have a scourge of uh, overdose uh, addiction and death in the country. In 2021, we set a new record for overdose deaths, 107,000, of which two-thirds two were um, it's synthetic opioids such as hydrocodone or Vicodin, oxycodone or Percocet, and especially fentanyl. So um, doing our, uh, during when I was doing the committee, uh, we looked extensively at napropathic medicine um, and found it to be an evidence evidence-based method um, for uh, reducing uh, acute and chronic pain and eliminating the need for opioid medications. That is the key. The other thing I want to say is this is not alternative medicine. It is integrative medicine. The difference is integrative medicine is frontline care. This is not secondary. This is frontline care uh, for um, medication. We need uh, modalities uh, that either by themselves or with other modalities, and this can be used with other modalities, will eliminate the need for opi uh, opioid medication. But all it takes is one to start um, the spiral of an opioid addiction that ruins the life of a person, a family, even businesses. Um, so I want to speak out very strongly uh, for this evidence-based uh, modality of acute and chronic pain care management. Thank you very much for letting me speak. If you are just joining us and would like to testify in opposition to AB 153, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. 
Thank you. Anyone here neutral? In Las Vegas, don't see anyone moving. BPS, anyone on the phones? If you would like to testify in neutral for AB 153, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you. I'll invite the bill sponsor up in closing comments. Okay, it seems like it's very popular in New, New Mexico. I heard someone say Las Cruces. Uh, so it's, it's spreading to Texas. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you all for the bill. Looks like you did your homework. Uh, and so with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 153. And uh, I'll entertain a motion to um, do pass. I have a motion from uh, Vice Chair Lang. I have a second. Second from Senator Daly. Additional questions? All in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, and I will give the um, floor statement to uh, Vice Chair Lang. Good testimonial. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's move Thank now you. to Assembly Bill 270. <laughs> oh, I strike up the band. It's Assemblywoman Marzola Day. <laughs> I promise, Chair, this is the last one you will hear today, at least from me. <laughs> Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Again, I'm Elaine Marzola, representing Assembly District 21. I'm here to present Assembly Bill 270. With me today, I have Jen Stever. Um, she is via Zoom. She is going to go over the bill, and I also have um, Dr. Richardson here with me who will be able to answer any questions that Chair you or the committee may have. You have heard repeatedly this session and today, um, Nevada has a severe health care provider shortage. Our goal with Assembly Bill 270 is to expand safe and supervised anesthesia services for Nevada residents. If this measure is passed, Nevada will join 19 other states plus the District of Columbia in allowing highly trained certified anesthesiologist assistants to work under the supervision of a certified and licensed anesthesiologist. <coughs> Assembly Bill 270 provides for the licensure and regulation of anesthesiologists anesthesiologist assistance by the Board of Medical Examiners and the State Board of Osteopathic Medicine. This bill includes procedures for regulating the practice of anesthesiologist assistance and for imposing discipline for violations of the governing statutes and regulations. Chair, with your permission, I would like to turn over to Jen Stever so she can go over the bill. Thank you, Assemblywoman Marzola, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak before the committee. My name is Jennifer Stever, and I'm a certified anesthesiologist assistant. I've been practicing here in Atlanta, Georgia for 18 years, with the majority of my time spent in cardiothoracic anesthesia. I'm also the current president of the National Professional Organization, the American Academy of Anesthesiologist Assistants, and I'd like to provide a brief summary of Assembly Bill 270. Section two through 18 creates a new license for certified anesthesiologist assistants or CAAs under the Board of Medical Examiners. It provides that a CAA assist in the practice of medicine under the supervision of an anesthesiologist. It defines the word assist to mean that the CAA personally performs the duties assigned to them. Defines the certification exam, which is currently administered by the National Commission for Certification of Anesthesiologist Assistants defines a supervising anesthesiologist as certified or eligible to be certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology. It establishes the scope of practice of an AA, which is also regulated by the facility and the anesthesiologist. It provides for the requirements to be licensed as an AA, including graduates from an accredited AA program, passes the national certification exam, applies for a license and meets all requirements set by the board. It requires a supervising anesthesiologist to be immediately available in such proximity to an AA that the physician is able to effectively reestablish direct contact with the patient. It allows an anesthesiologist to supervise CAAs in a manner consistent with federal law, one to four. 
sections 19 through 40 amend current law to provide for CAAs to be regulated by the medical board and include CAAs in the regulations pertaining to a physician, perfusionist, physician assistant, and practitioner of respiratory care. This includes a process for investigating complaints and the imposition, and the imposition of disciplinary action. Sections 41 through 57 create a new license for AAs under the Board of Osteopathic Medicine. Sections 58 through 105 provide for AAs to be regulated by the Board of Osteopathic Medicine in a manner consistent with regula regulations pertaining to an osteopathic physician and physician assistant. And for a little history, CAAs have been providing safe, cost-effective anesthesia care across the country for more than 50 years. CAAs work in the anesthesia care team model thus expanding access to visit physician-led anesthesia care, which is the safest anesthesia care for the patients of Nevada. I have been involved with the didactic and clinical training of CAAs for over 15 years. Matriculants must complete all of the prerequisites required for admission into medical school or other physician assistant training programs. Many students often have previous clinical experience, including, but not limited to, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, and scribes. CAAs undergo graduate level training encompassing the physiology, pathophysiology, pharmacology, and airway management necessary to become safe anesthesia providers. Students graduate from independently accredited AA programs with upwards of 600 anesthetics performed and more than 2,000 clinical hours of anesthesia training. Graduates of accredited AA programs must pass a national certifying exam administered by an independent certifying organization. Practicing CAAs must complete 50 hours of continued medical education every two years, along with successful completion of a continuing certification exam administered every 10 years. CAAs are trained in all aspects of anesthesia care, including general anesthesia, regional anesthesia, and monitored anesthesia care. If you've had a colonoscopy, you've probably had monitored anesthesia care. CAAs are trained to perform spinal and epidural anesthesia, peripheral nerve blocks, and place invasive monitors like arterial lines and pulmonary artery catheters. These are the monitors necessary to keep you safe while having heart surgery. CAAs are licensed and regulated by the State Board of Medicine with delineation of privileges and hiring practices specific to individual facilities. CAAs are currently authorized to practice in 19 states, the District of Columbia, and the VA system. CAAs are defined by the Center for Medicare Services, or CMS, as non-physician anesthetist and reimbursed in the medical direction model of one physician anesthesiologist directing up to four anesthetists. Anesthesia services provided by CAAs are reimbursed by Medicare, TRICARE, state Medicaid, and commercial payers. Licensure of CAAs in the state of Nevada will increase access to physician-led anesthesia care thus ensuring greater access to the highest quality care necessary during surgery and procedures for the residents of Nevada. CAAs who hail from the state of Nevada, several of whom are in the room with you, want to come home and provide care to the patients in their home state. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions and I will hand off to Dr. Richardson. <clears throat> Hello, my name is uh, Dr. Shana Richardson. That's S-H-A-I-N-A-R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-S-O-N. Um, first, I'd like to thank the chair and the members of the committee for the opportunity to testify before you today. I am a board certified physician anesthesiologist. I've been practicing in Reno as part of the largest uh, anesthesia group in northern Nevada for about seven years. And I've been on the governance board of that uh, group for about the past, past five years. I'm also the immediate past president of the Washoe County Medical Society, which is a nonprofit organization representing all types of physicians in Northern Nevada. And I'm also the co-chair of the Government Affairs Committee of the Nevada State Medical Association, our similar state organization. And personally, I've also worked directly with um, anesthesiologist assistants, or who I'll refer to as AAs, while I was doing my residency in Colorado. While we were there, we also began a training program for AAs, so I worked with student AAs. And since I've been back in Nevada, I have been taking AA students as part of an away rotation um, from out of state to come and work back in a Nevada hospital. I would like to just focus on three specific things that I think are really important to this bill, and that's safety, cost, and shortage. First, safety. 
AAs function identically with, uh, to nurse anesthetist, nurse anesthetist um, within the anesthesia care team model. Their equivalency in patient safety has been shown in multiple studies, and this bill does require supervision of AAs um, by a physician. And there have been several studies, but specifically a very good peer-reviewed silver study that over uh, about 200,000 anesthetics that showed that when physician anesthesiologists were specifically involved in the care, there was a lower death rate in complicated cases about two and a half per 1,000 cases, a lower mortality rate, which is not insignificant. Second is cost. Anesthesia services themselves are reimbursed at the same rate regardless of who delivers an anesthetic. So if we're paid $100 for an anesthetic, if I perform that myself, I would get that entire fee. If I perform it with um, in a supervisory model, we would split that fee. So that means there is no increased cost to either the patient or to the state. Um, also, uh, insurance companies classify AAs equally um, as, in terms of risk as they do to CRNAs, which means my malpractice uh, insurance would not increase whether I practiced independently uh, or whether I practiced as part of an anesthesia care team model with use, using either AAs or CRNAs. And AAs also carry their own malpractice insurance. And lastly, shortage. As everyone on this committee knows, we have a really deep shortage of healthcare providers, and anesthesia has been particularly hard hit. This isn't entirely surprising since COVID because people basically cough on us for a living. So we've lost a lot of people from our profession, and it's been really hard to keep people for a full length of the career. I personally have started working a lot more over the last several years, and I regularly work over 80 hours a week, and if I didn't have a very patient and understanding spouse, it would be very difficult to maintain this for much longer. I really, really do love my job. I love serving this community, but I worry that these types of hours and under these conditions is going to drive a lot more providers to significant burnout, and I really... I think that by passing this bill, we would significantly increase the pool of pro providers from which we could hire, and our practice absolutely would be willing to hire um, AAs into, this into our practice if this bill were to pass. I think AAs are competent, safe, valuable members of the anesthesia care team. They're tried and true, and I urge you to please pass AB 270 to allow for the licensure of AAs in Nevada. Thank you. Thank you. You can breathe now. <laughs> I apologize to talk very quickly. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Um, questions? Senator Stone and then Senator Daly and then Senator Pazina. Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. And uh, you're absolutely right. We do have a shortage. And I think in the rural areas, this could be very, very helpful. Um, when you say that uh, the supervising anesthesiologist has to be immediately available, does that mean they have to be physically on the, on the site or they can be available by Zoom? And then uh, I just want to verify that the number of uh, AAs that an uh, uh, anesthesiologist can oversee is four. The ratio is four to one. Is that correct? Shana Richardson, for the record. Uh, for your first question, yes, immediately available does mean immediately on site. So we would not be able to supervise via Zoom. It would be um, on this, and it would be the same physical location. It couldn't be a hospital across town. It would be if they had any sort of urgency or emergency and they called me, I would need to be there very, very very, very quickly. Um, for your second question, uh, yes, the supervision would be four to one, which is in line with federal regulations via the CMS guidelines. Senator Daly. Well, that was one of my questions, but uh, got, got that answered four to one. Uh, did I misunderstand in the testimony when you said they have to be supervised by a physician or does it have to be an anesthesiologist that supervises them or can it be a combination? It, in other words, anesthesiologist or physician or both uh, on the supervision. This is Dr. Shana Richardson for the record. Uh, it does specifically have to be a physician anesthesiologist is my understanding. Okay, so just real quick, so it can't be any MD, it has to be an anesthesiologist. Yes. Elaine Marzola for the record, that is correct. The supervision has to be of a certified, certified and licensed anesthesiologist. Thank you. Senator Pazina. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. So could an anesthesiology assistant provide the anesthesiology as a patient is going under, or are they 
monitoring the condition after the patient has already received the anesthetics. Thank you. Thank you for the question. This is Shana Richardson again. Uh, they do have, they will be involved in all aspects of the patient's care, um, but if they have to be supervised under the regulations of medical direction and there are specific stages throughout the anesthetic, think of uh, pilots flying, you know, flying a plane. The takeoff and landing is the highest risk part, and those parts are moments in which the anesthesiologist needs to be physically present supervising the AA. Additional questions? No. Okay. Any other presenters? No. Okay. Thank you, Chair. All right. If you want to step back, and we will now open it up for public testimony and support. Support here in Carson City. And if you're in Vegas, yes, come to the table. Okay. And we'll start in Carson City. Begin when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. My name is Stephanie Zunini, Z-U-N-I-N-I, -I, and I'm here today to s testify in support of AB 270. I am a certified anesthesiologist assistant and the current president of the Nevada Academy of Anesthesiologist Assistants. I'm a fifth generation, born and raised Nevadan, but I currently live and practice in Denver, Colorado, because I'm unable to do so in my home state. I'd like to thank my dad who's sitting behind me for picking me up very late from the airport last night to make it here this morning. <laughs> um, I'm a Millennium Scholar, just like some of the other CAAs here today that were paid by the state of Nevada to earn a higher education. And as of right now, we are unfortunately unable to use our desperately needed skills as anesthesia providers in our home state. There is undoubtedly an anesthesia provider shortage here in Nevada. If passed, this bill will in no means fully correct the shortage of anesthesia providers, but it will license an additional category of advanced practice provider that is currently used safely and successfully in many other states across the country every single day. CAAs must and will always eagerly work under the direction of a physician anesthesiologist. Passing this bill does not increase any cost to the patient or the hospital. It also does not require the use of CAAs, but it will allow for the option to use them. Please show your commitment to healthcare workforce expansion and support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Spearman and esteemed committee members for allowing me to give testimony. <clears throat> I would like to thank Chairwoman Marzola for sponsoring this bill. Um, for the record, my name is Rachel Matsumura, M-A-T-S-U-M-U-R-A, and I'm here to testify in support of AB 270. I would also like to thank my father for being here and picking me up um, last night as well at midnight. So we're just happy to be here today. Um, I'm a certified anesthesiologist assistant currently working at an Indiana University affiliated hospital in Indianapolis. I'm an advanced practice provider that would love to give back to my community and provide safe anesthesia care to the citizens of Nevada. Both of my parents, grandma, and many close friends live in Nevada and I would love to return to my home state to be with them. AB 270 would bring a new category of highly educated and safe advanced practice providers that would work in the physician-led um, anesthesia care team model. I want to thank the committee members for allowing me to give my testimony and hope you will support AB 270 because Nevada is in dire need for more anesthesia safe providers. Thank you. Thank you. So you're a Hoosier? Naptown. Go Naptown. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susan Fisher with McDonald Carano, and I got the salmon jacket memo this morning. I'm speaking on behalf of the Nevada State Board of Osteopathic Medicine. We are in full support of this bill. I would also like to add an important component of this bill is workforce development and economic development, and you will hear a little bit more about that from a caller um, who's online today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Sarah Watkins. I represent the Nevada State Medical Association here in support of AB 270. As a physician and patient advocacy organization, the Nevada State Medical Association supports this bill. Passage of this bill will help expand the need for supervised mid-level providers and provide more quality care in a very needed space here in this state. We thank the Chair Marzola for bringing this bill forward and for working with members of our association. Thank you. Hold on just a minute. Let me go down south to Las Vegas, and then we'll come back up here. Las Vegas? Las Vegas? Hi, my name's... 
Yes, my name's Jada Wilson, um, or Jada Wabanimke, W-A-B-A-N-I-M-K-E-E. -E. Um, I'm sharing my testimony on why CAA should be considered for licensure and employment in the state of Nevada. I am a certified anesthesiologist assistant who accepted a job in Kansas City because CAAs are not licensed in my home state. I was raised in Nevada after my family was stationed in Ellis Air Force Base. I graduated with an advanced honors diploma in biotechnology here in Las Vegas. Continued my education and graduated magna cum laude from the University of Nevada, Reno with the bachelor's in biochemistry and molecular biology. During undergrad, I worked as a clinical lab assistant. Um, I commissioned into the Nevada Army National Guard soon after as a lieutenant in the Medical Services Corps, where the life of 40 plus soldiers are dependent upon my command and decision making skills. 40 plus Nevada residents, your neighbors, your children, my ties to Nevada are evident. And through these last past three years as a master's student, I've paid for flights to Nevada out of my own pocket each month to continue to serve my community that I grew up in, only to not be able to have the option to work here once I graduate. The military shares a similar stressing and critical decision-making environment that is required of an anesthesia provider. And if I can lead Nevada's family members into battle, I should surely be trusted under the supervision of experienced anesthesiologist. My undergraduate degree was paid for by the Nevada National Guard and as a Millennium Scholar recipient. On the Millennium Scholar website, it reads, we want to ensure Nevada's best scholars stay in Nevada. Yet I'm here today to say one of Nevada's best scholars cannot stay in Nevada. As one person, um, one person, the state at minimum dedicated $70,000 to ensure I had quality education from Nevada in hopes that they could retain me. And now I'd be considered a loss to the state and eventually transfer out of my Nevada National Guard unit and out of the community of those I've served simply because I can't make a living here. Um, we're here to change that today and vote in favor for the licensure of CAAs in the state of Nevada. Thank you for your time. So thank you. Are you still in the Guard? I know you said you had to transfer out of Nevada. Are you still in the Guard? Are you, uh, did you go to Missouri or Kansas? Which, which Kansas City are you? Are you on the Missouri side or Kansas side? I'm in the Kansas City, Missouri, ma'am. Um, and yes, uh, I am actually still in the Guard. I flew out here this morning thanks to um, Nevada Quad A and Stephanie out there helping me out. But um, yep, I just came out here and so I have drilled this weekend. Okay, thank you. So you went to Brook, San Antonio? This you did training? Yes? She didn't expect all this. She said, what is this? What is this? Oh, I'm just <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm retired Army, so that's why I asked. And <clears throat> Brooke is certainly a nice place to be if you're in San Antonio at the right time of the year. So that's all. Yeah, I, I was out in Fort Sam, ma'am. OK, thank you. Back up here in Carson City? Good morning, ma'am, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Michaela Rezai, R-E-Z-A-E-I, with McDonald Carano, representing the Nevada Orthopedic Society, and we appreciate Assemblywoman Marzola bringing this forward. Nevada is in dire need of health care providers, and AB 270 will assist in filling that gap, and we urge this body to support. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the committee. Amy Shogun with Black and Wadhams here on behalf of the Nevada Hospital Association, and we are in full support of this legislation. Thank you. Madam Chair, good morning. Dan Musgrove with Strategy 360 representing U.S. Anesthesia Partners. We are probably the largest anesthesia group in the state with 90 doctors, and as you heard today, that's not enough. So we absolutely support this bill and, and appreciate this committee passing it. Uh, Chair Spearman, members of the committee, Connor Kane, on behalf of Sunrise Hospital and Sunri Sunrise Children's Hospital and HCA Healthcare, uh, we are in support of, of this bill. And uh, I'm not wearing a salmon colored jacket, but I did get the fish memo today and have a baby shark tie. Thank you. Good morning, Senator. Blaine Osborne, Nevada Rural Hospital Partners, uh, for the record, an enthusiastic ditto. Thank you. I thought this was pink. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> For the record, Jerry Matsumura, M-A-T-S-U-M-U-R-A, representing Nevada State Side of Anesthesiologists. I think enough's been said. Um, I'll spare you all this material, and we're in strong support of AB 270. Thank you. Um, thank you. Safe ride back from the airport. <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else here in support? BPS, anyone on the phones? 
If you would like to testify in support of AB 270, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. BPS, anyone on the phone lines? Yes, Chair, one moment. Caller ending in 932, you are unmuted and may begin. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Shane Angus. That's S-H-A-N-E-A-N-G-U-S. <clears throat> I am a certified anesthesiologist assistant and I am the chair of the association of anesthesiologist assistant education programs representing over 20 academic members across the United States. For over 50 years, our member institutions have matriculated and graduated anesthesiologist assistants that provide safe, quality anesthesia care within the anesthesia care team model. All of our programs are at a graduate level and award a master's degree. All programs must be accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Allied Health Education Programs all programs are associated with a medical school and have a physician anesthesiologist as their medical director. All students complete a pre-medical curriculum, take the MCAT or the GRE, and have highly competitive applications. All students complete a rigorous academic and clinical curriculum and is focused on clinical competency outcomes. Nationally, our members have incredibly commendable retention rates, graduation rates, and board passage rates and importantly, employment rates. Thank you for your time and support. Chair, there is no additional testimony at this time. Thank you. We'll move now to those in opposition here in Carson City. I don't see anyone moving here, no one moving in Las Vegas. BPS, anyone on the phones? Opposition. Chair, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you. Anyone here testifying neutral? Vegas? BPS? Anyone on the phones? Opposition? Thank you, Chair. There are no callers to provide testimony at this time. Okay, thank you. Okay, no closing comments. And to the lieutenant down in um, Vegas, I wasn't trying to grill you. I was stationed at Sam Houston for four years, so, okay. <laughs> All right, so we will close the hearing now on Assembly Bill 270, and uh, I'll entertain a motion. Have a motion from Vice Chair Lang to pass. Have a second from Senator Hammond. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Thank you, and the ayes have it. Um, Senator Hammond, you want to take a floor statement? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have one more bill. Uh, so now we'll open the hearing now on Assembly Bill 503. And welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Bradley Wilkinson, Chief Deputy Legislative Counsel. I'm here today in my capacity as an attorney in the legal division of the Legislative Counsel Bureau to present AB 503, a bill that's requested by the Legislative Council in coordination with the Records, Communication, and Compliance Division of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, before beginning my presentation, I need to make the disclosure that um, as an employee of the Legislative Council Bureau, I'm prohibited from encouraging the passage or failure of legislation, but I may make recommendations. Uh, 
By way of background, Congress authorized the FBI to conduct criminal history background checks for the purposes of licensing and employment in 1972 through the enactment of Public Law 92544. Pursuant to that public law, the FBI is empowered to share criminal history record information with officials of state and local governments if authorized by a state statute which has been approved by the Attorney General. The Attorney General has delegated the authority to approve statutes to the FBI. I'm scrolling here. FBI policy requires that uh, fingerprints must be initially submitted to the State Identification Bureau. That's the central repository here for a state criminal history records check and thereafter to the FBI for a national criminal history records check. All legislation enacting or revising a statute has to be submitted to the FBI through the central repository for the FBI's review and approval before the FBI will accept fingerprints and provide CHRI under the newer revised statute. Um, I believe some of the statutes amended in this bill are still subject to a grace period granted by the FBI, but the grace period has already lapsed for some other statutes. Uh, Congress first enacted this public law in 1972 in 2000, 28 years later, the FBI did its first audit of all statutes in the country and found that many of them were not in compliance with the federal law. With respect to Nevada, the FBI found that almost half of Nevada's statutes did not comply with the federal law. 13 of 29 were actually out of compliance. Following that review, like many other states, Nevada introduced legislation to fix any statutes that had been uh, reviewed and rejected by the FBI. During the 2003 legislative session, the legislature passed and the governor signed AB 155, which was a bill that I worked on, um, to fix the statutes rejected by the FBI. We fixed one or two statutes each session since then, but 2003 was the last time the legislature um, made a major revision to ensure compliance with federal law. The revisions that you see today in AB 503 have actually been in the works for about four years. We began working with the division in 2019 uh, to fix the statutes that had been rejected. We were going to bring a bill last session, but we just ran out of time. Um, the revisions in the bill address a variety of problems the FBI found with our statutes. For example, they found that certain sections of NRS are overbroad in their applicability or description of the applicants who must submit fingerprints, and certain statutes improperly authorize the release of criminal history record information to a private person or entity. This bill was much larger as originally introduced, but we took out some sections relating to professional licensing boards, and we're going to continue working with the division on some of the issues over the interim and come back in 2025 with a bill hopefully addressing anything remaining. With that in mind, I'll quickly run through the sections of the bill and describe what statutes we're fixing and why. And again, bear in mind, all of these statutes were rejected by the FBI in recent years. Sections 7, 8, and 11 of the bill fix some statutes that exempt volunteers who are likely to have unsupervised contact with pupils from the requirement to submit fingerprints and undergo a background check if those volunteers had already had a background check conducted by another entity in the past six months. We cleaned up these statutes by clarifying that the entity which conducted the investigation must be a public entity. And we also did our best to make sure the statute meets all the other requirements set forth in the federal guidelines. Sections 9, 12, 13, and 89 make additional changes with respect to background checks in the educational context. The FBI determined that these sections don't meet the requirements of the public law 92544. 
because they improperly authorized the dissemination of criminal history record information to a private person. For that reason, those provisions are removed and conforming changes are made. Section 10 of the bill has a statute the FBI rejected because it believed the language other auxiliary non-professional personnel is too broad a term for the purposes of background checks. So we replace that term with paraprofessionals, which is a defined term in the NRS. Sections 51, 52, and 53 pertain to dental matters and relate to statutes that were considered to be overly broad. Uh, for example, there's no definition of dentistry in the chapter, so we added the definition of dentistry in section 51. Section 52 has a conforming change. In section 53, the FBI felt that the language in the current statute referring to any of the special branches of dental hygiene, dental therapy, or dentistry was overly broad, so we simply removed that phrase. In section 60, the FBI determined that one sentence in the psychology interjurisdictional compact improperly authorizes dissemination of criminal history record information to private entities. So we removed that sentence and specifically stated that a compact state is prohibited from submitting to the coordinated database any criminal history record information obtained from a report of the central repository or the FBI. Section 61 pertains to marriage and family therapists and clinical professional counselors. Currently, fingerprinting authority only exists for an expedited license by endorsement so we gave specific authorization for other types of licenses in Chapter 641A. Section 65 of the bill pertains to the Nevada Funeral and Cemetery Services Board. That statute was not approved by the FBI because the specific applicants were not identified in the statute. So we revised that to identify each type of license, certificate, or permit. Sections 81 to 84 relate to the Cannabis Compliance Board and define the terms board member, officer, owner, and ownership interests for purposes of background checks of persons associated with medical cannabis establishments and adult use cannabis establishments, as the FBI has determined that those terms are overly broad. Uh, Section 85 makes a conforming change to indicate the placement of those sections in NRS. And lastly, Section 89 repeals a statute relating to the State Board of Cosmetology that improperly authorizes the sharing of criminal history record information between certain entities. So that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the bill. Thank you. Uh, Senator Daly, question? Hmm? No. Yeah, my question, maybe I just was reading it wrong, that seemed to be in Section 13 when you talk about the private schools, and it just maybe seems counterintuitive when I was reading it that you eliminate the fingerprint requirements for those people. Now they can get into other databases for a background check, um, but I, I wasn't following the distinction um, by eliminating the fingerprint requirement and then the date the other information that they can still access uh, regarding background checks at private schools. Yes. Uh, Senator, that, that is correct. In that section, name, you have... Name, um, name, name, name. Bradley Wilkinson, name. for the record. <laughs> I don't usually do that at my committee. I just speak. Um, that uh, statute was rejected by the FBI because... You cannot share criminal history record information with a private person or entity, which also includes a private school or the administrator headmaster of a private school. So that uh, portion is taken out. The other part about the uh, statewide central registry for the collection of information concerning the abuse or neglect of a child um, is obviously not the FBI's database, so that we kept that in and that remains in law.
additional questions? Senator Buck? Thank you, Chair Spearman. I was wondering if, um, if you're an educator, you already have your um, fingerprints all done, and, the, and then every few years when you have to get a renewal of license, you get them done. But if you're applying then to a state government agency, you have to do it again? Um, Bradley Wilkinson for the record. That's um, not actually addressed in the bill, but I think the answer to your question is yes, you have to do that. The, the FBI is very careful about um, protecting the sharing of information, even especially with private entities, you simply cannot do that. Uh, with public entities, you uh, have a very limited ability for them to share that. It has to be very close in time. I'm not sure what the outer range of time is, but um, anything over a year is probably too long. And it has to be for the same purpose and very closely related. So uh, any kind of statute like that, generally you're just going to have to go ahead and do the fingerprints over again because they've rejected other ones that uh, have any kind of extensive time period or not tied to exactly the same purpose. Senator Pizzino. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, admittedly, we received these bills very late into the evening and then haven't had, so I have not reviewed it as closely, so I, I'm sure there's an easy answer to this, but in sec I, I was looking at existing law um, as pertains to Section 9, and we maintain a list of names. Um, the I should say the Nevada Department of Education maintains a list of names for those whose licenses are denied due to a conviction of a sexual offense involving a minor, they update that list monthly and provide a list to the board of trustees in a school district um, upon request. And Section 9 removes those provisions. Why is that? Bradley Wilkinson, for the record. Um, that's a very good question. And uh, the reason for that, I, I think it's a couple of reasons, actually. We, we did this bill in connection with the records communication and compliance division um, so we took some of their suggestions I understand they were working with the Department of Education as to what they wanted to do too so they working in conjunction suggested this language removing this I suspect that um, the reason for that is any kind of criminal history record information that is in that um, you know contained in that list or made up or derived from that list cannot be shared um, so I believe that's the reason it's removed I don't know if the records communication compliance division oh, Erica's back there um, if she could give you more information that's what I know that came from Department of Education through them, and um, I believe that was the reason for the deletion of that language. Good morning, Erica Suzyamas for the record. Um, the, the deletion of that language, um, it was removed because the FBI was concerned that those records contain criminal history record information. And as Brad spoke to, um, the FBI is very particular on who the CRI, criminal history record information, is shared with. Thank you, Chair. May I follow up? So I guess my concern is that if those who are going to come into close unsupervised contact with children, those records were being shared. Is there still someone those records are shared with so that we can protect children in our schools? Erica Susie Yamas, for the record, I'm not sure I can answer that question for you. I apologize. I can try to get the information. Okay. Okay. But, but there's no, no prohibition uh, if someone wanted to do another background check. You just can't share the existing information, but you can, they can do another background check, correct? No? Ind independent of what the FBI has. Erica Suzyamas, for the record, correct. If it's for a different purpose, um, so the FBI does prohibit information sharing if the purposes of the background checks differ. So. Um, 
an individual would be fingerprinted for the Department of Education for licensing purposes, that's one purpose. And if they go to a school district and are fingerprinted for employment with the school district, that's a different purpose, licensing versus employment. Okay. Yeah. So, just a quick question. Um, so I had to get a TS clearance, top secret clearance, when I was at the Pentagon, and then they did another one when I was selected for a UN assignment. So that information kind of carried over. I had one of my classmates from fourth grade call me. Said, "What kind of trouble are you in?" <laughs> I said, I'm not in trouble. Somebody came here and asked me what kind of person you were. And I'm like, what? She said, I told him neither one of us know how to do long division because we talked all the way through it in fourth grade. You know? <laughs> um, so so that, was, that was specifically for a military assignment. So if, if that information was done for a military assignment, if there was something like a paramilitary assignment, could that information be shared? You understand what I'm saying? And, I, and I'm, trying, I'm trying to put it in context with um, if something, someone was, uh, had a background check, if they were not a teacher, but they were someone closely um, related to that profession. And I'm just trying to get the distinction here. Erica Suzuyamas, it would have to be for the exact like purpose. Okay. Additional presenters? No? Okay, so if you step back, we will uh, open up testimony uh, for S Assembly Bill 503. Anyone here in Carson City? Anyone in Las Vegas? Don't see anyone moving. BPS, anyone on the phones? Chair, there are no callers at this mm -hmm. time. Okay. Thank you. Anyone here in Carson City uh, in opposition? I don't see anyone in, is that someone moving in Las Vegas? No, it looks like security. Uh, so anyone, BPS, anyone on the phones? Chair, there are no callers at this time. Okay, we'll move now to those who are neutral. Anyone testifying in neutral here in Carson City, in Las Vegas? And, and I know you said there's no one on the phone, but let me just say it again for the record. Anyone on the phone with BPS testifying neutral? Thank you, Chair. There are no callers to provide testimony at this time. Thank you. Uh, and with that, we will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 503. Um, I think we're going to, let's try to move this one. Um, any questions? You know, questions. So I will entertain a motion. Have a motion from Senator Daly. Have a second from Vice Chair Lang. Additional questions? All in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, no. And the, okay, so, so Senator Pazina, no, waiting, wanting to reserve. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so the ayes have it, and uh, Senator Daly, you want to take the um, floor statement? Okay. Thank you. And with that, I think we have um, concluded our business for today, but we will be back here. I understand there are several, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Public comment, duh. Uh, anybody here in Carson City? Anyone in Las Vegas? BPS, anyone on the phones? Chair, the public lines are open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, and so uh, we've got a number of bills that are coming. I think we'll probably get some of them today. Um, they'll probably pass them out of the assembly and come over here today. So uh, just watch your email and uh, make sure your LAs are um, paying attention. Uh, we'll, we'll either meet on Saturday or if we get a bunch of them in today and we can, you know, move them, uh, put them on the agenda for tomorrow, that's what we'll do. And I just want to do that because I want to give uh, everyone's bill a chance to be heard until we get, you know, before we get right up to a sine die. So we're going to do our best, and for those of you who have bills that may be coming over, 
if you all can help us out, and um, whether you're here or you're listening, if you all can help us out and uh, make sure you work the bills, because uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of time to read them. But if you take the time to come and talk to us, maybe we can understand them a lot better before you get here. And so, um, any other questions? All righty. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. No more pink jackets. <laughs> <laughs>